and good evening. Uh, good evening in Chicago and good morning in Hong Kong. My name is Brian Hansen and I'm the Vice President for Studies at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And I wanna thank all of you for being here tonight for the Zoom on the Record program. And I wanna say a special thanks to our members. Also generous year round sponsorship of the Council's China's Changing Landscape program series is provided by the Dr. Scholl Foundation. We will also have a part of the program where you can submit questions. And in order to do that, you can go to your browser, web browser and type in ccga.live and you'll be able to submit your questions there. As a reminder, the council is a nonprofit, independent, nonpartisan platform and the views expressed by the individuals we host are their own and do not represent the institutional positions of the council. Now it's my great honor to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Weijian Chen is the chairman and CEO of PAG, a Hong Kong-based private equity firm with about $38 billion in capital under management. He has previously held positions at TPG Asia, JP Morgan, the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, and the Beijing University of International Business and Economics. He holds an MA and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MBA from the University of San Francisco. And his incredible life story is chronicled in his book, uh, Out of the Gobi, My Story of China and America, which I can highly recommend. Um, and it is available for sale through our partner, uh, the bookseller. He's also the author of a forthcoming book called Money Games. Dr. Sean uh, is going to share with us uh, some slides and, and part of his story. Then we'll move to a discussion where he and I will have a conversation for a little bit, and then I'll open it up to you so that you can ask uh, your questions. Uh, Shan, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for that nice introduction. It's a great privilege, honor for me to be here. Thank you. I thank you. And I know you've got a presentation that you'd like to um, share with us to get us going. Yes, let me try to get to it. <laughs> you see it? Yes. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone. Good evening. It's a great honor for me to be here. I'm going to talk about the book that I wrote, Adam Nagobi, My Story of China and America. I wrote this book not as an autobiography, but as a memoir. It is an eyewitness account of what I consider to be the most horrific part of the Chinese history, which I and my peers lived through. I think this part of the history is very important because I think history informs the present day. And there are certain lessons in history, many of which are very bitter and shouldn't be repeated. And that's the reason I wrote this book. This is the cover of the book. And uh, let me bring you back to the meat of the story where it started, which was in 1966, the Cultural Revolution in China broke out. What was it? I think it will become self-evident as I go on. What you see here is a picture of a gentleman standing side by side with Mao, Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you see that he is portrayed side by side with Mao on the front page of the People's Daily on October 1st, 1959, which was the 10th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. And this gentleman's name is Liu Shaoqi. He was actually the head of the state. He was the president of the country. Mao was chairman of the party, but nominally the head of the state was Liu Shaoqi. And this was in 1959. Seven years later, the Cultural Revolution 
broke out. And this is what happened to him. He was dragged out of his residence by red guards. He was harassed. He was abused. And he was persecuted. And eventually, he was thrown into prison without any process whatsoever and without even public knowledge. Nobody knew what happened to him. And he was the president of the country. Three years later in 1969, during the height of the Cultural Revolution, he died nameless in a prison cell in the province far away from Beijing. Again, without anybody knowing about it, there was no public knowledge of his death and there was no announcement at all. In fact, nobody knew where his ashes went. And his wife was 47 years old. This was the first lady of China. She was dragged out by the Red Guards to be humiliated, to be struggled against in front of 300,000 students of Tsinghua University, college students. You see on the left-hand side, she was wearing this exaggerated necklace that was made of ping pong ball, ping pong balls. And red guards forced her to wear this ping pong ball necklace to humiliate her, to suggest that she had a preference for a capitalistic lifestyle. She was thrown into prison, into solid confinement for 12 years, during which she didn't see anyone. And she survived the 12 years of solitary confinement. She was very tough. She survived the Cultural Revolution, but she didn't know her husband died a long time ago when she was in prison. This was a year when I was 12 years old. I was just about to finish elementary school. And then all of a sudden, we were told all the schools were shut down because this cultural revolution broke out. Initially, honestly, I was pretty happy. I thought we were going to have a long vacation. I didn't realize, in fact, this vacation lasted as long as 10 years. So for 10 years, between 1966 and 1976, for a vast country, which is China, of 800 million people, there was no schooling. So I missed secondary schooling completely. So Brian was telling you about my graduate degrees, which I have three from the United States, but in China, I didn't have any degree at all. I missed secondary education at all. And that was how chaotic the situation was during that period of time. Even the president of the country disappeared and died in prison. This gentleman, his name was Peng De Huai. He was the first defense minister of People's Republic of China. He was one of the founding fathers. He fought with Mao to found the People's Republic. He was the commander in chief of Chinese forces in the Korean War. And he fought the Americans, the UN forces to a standstill at 38th parallel that we still see today. So he was considered to be, of course, a hero in China at the time, one of the founding fathers. But in 1959, he offended Mao by being mildly critical of Mao's policies of Great Leap Forward, which was designed to rapidly industrialize China, to catch up with America and the United Kingdom within a very short period of time. But that policy was disastrous. Eventually, it produced a great famine 
which lasted for about uh, three years between 1960, 1959 and 1962, during which time about 30 million people died of starvation. And that, that was a great famine during that period of time. So he was critical of Mao's policies. And for that offense, he was removed from all his positions. He was purged. He was fired as a defense minister. He was exiled into the southwest part of China. That was 1959. And then seven years later, the Red Guards dragged him back from the place of exile and persecuted him, harassed him, beat him up, and eventually he also died in prison. And that was the first defense minister of the People's Republic. And this gentleman, his name was Xi Zhongxun. He was the father of China's current president, Xi Jinping. Xi, Zhong, Xi Zhongxun, the father, was vice premier in 1963. And he endorsed the publication of a book about some people fighting in the Red Army base where he was one of the leaders. But that book was considered as a poisonous weed by Mao. And for that offense, he was stripped of all his positions. He was exiled, he was put in prison, and his name was not cleared until after the Cultural Revolution, 18 years later, and during which time he suffered and both sufferings. And all of that for endorsing the publication of a book. So I know how dangerous it is to publish a book. So Mao started the Cultural Revolution. He called upon the Red Guards, who were college students and middle school students, to rise up, to, to uh, rise up against almost everything in authority in the establishment government officials, starting from the president of the country to officials at every level, rise up against any authority in academics, in culture, in everything. So the entire country was thrown into chaos. In the month of August, 1966, I saw a statistic that middle school students in Beijing beat many of their teachers and principals to death. And in that month alone, 1,700 middle school teachers were beaten to death by their students. What was their offense? Who knows? For teaching not working class ideas, for having capitalistic ideas, but Mao, in that month, August 18th of 1966, began to review the records in Tiananmen Square. And in that year, he reviewed the records eight times in Tiananmen Square. He called upon them to go out of Beijing to spread the fire of revolution to all of China, to every corner of China. So the fire of cultural revolution touched every corner of China and Red Guards went into a rampage everywhere in the country. And schools, of course, were shut down. Many of the factories were shut down. The entire country was brought to a standstill. And pretty soon, Red Guards were not content with fighting the establishment or tearing down the establishment, it was total anarchy. There were, no, there were no governments anymore and you could travel around the country without having to worry about transportation because everything is free. Cars, uh, not cars, buses, trains, everything was free. So the red cars were roaming around the country 
and uh, spreading the fire of the revolution. Eventually, they decided that uh, they wanted to show that each of them was more revolutionary than others. So they started to fight with each other. I'm talking about physical violence. So the entire country descended into violence. I was able to find only one picture on the left-hand side to show one of the findings. And on the right-hand side is the artist rendition of what happened after one of the fightings between the Red Guards. In fact, the reality was much more grim than what you see here. During those years, hundreds of thousands of people were killed by fighting with each other. They used guns, cannons, even tanks to fight with each other. The military was not supposed to be involved in the Cultural Revolution, and their orders were not to resist if anybody attacked them. So the Red Guards disarmed the military in many places and used the weapons to fight with each other. Eventually, Mao even thought things were totally out of control. He called the Cultural Revolution a full-scale civil war. And by 1969, there were so many young people of my age, I was 15 years by that time, middle school students, elementary school students, college students, having no school to go to, no jobs to do, roaming around the cities, looking for trouble, getting into trouble, fighting with each other, and the entire China was in total chaos. So Mao came up with the idea to bring the situation under control. He decided to send all the young people, all the students, known as educated youth, to the most remote parts of China, to the border areas, to the countryside. So in 1969, as I was 15 years old, I was sent along with my peers to the Gobi Desert of China. If you look at this map of China, it looks like the shape of a rooster. Beijing is located near the throat of the rooster. And if you look at the back of this rooster, it says Gobi Desert. And below the Gobi Desert, you see this red dotted line, which is the Great Wall of China. In ancient times, China built the Great Wall to keep the barbarians out of China proper, and that's where the, the wall was built. The Gobi Desert was not inhabited by people, and that's why it was north of the Great Wall. And I was sent over there, along with many of my peers. And this is the terrain that you see this place. And this picture was taken more recently, but I can assure you 50 years ago when I was sent there, the inside picture was myself when I first went over there. The terrain was exactly the same at that time as it is today. But we spent years and years working on that piece of land. And our job was to turn that desert into fertile farmland. We worked extremely hard, 10, 12, 14, sometimes 16 hours a day under the blazing sun, never enough to eat with a starved stomach. And in winter time, minus 10, 20, we had to work on this piece of land and trying to make it fertile. It reminds me actually last time, last year, I was scheduled to go to Chicago for this particular event. It was the coldest day on record in Chicago. Even flights were canceled. So I was not able to go over there. But that was the routine average temperature in the Gobi Desert where I spent many years. So I thought to myself that uh, this Chicago people are really very soft <laughs> in this kind of weather. Uh, they shut down everything. Whereas when I was in the Gobi, of course, we worked extremely hard even in winter time. And when we first arrived there, there was no housing. So we had to dig holes in the ground to spend the night. 
winter was coming, it was extremely cold. Eventually, we built some shelters for ourselves. Uh, this is the terrain that gives you another idea of how it looks like. Everywhere you look around, uh, it's very, very difficult to find any shelter. And this picture was taken by a friend of mine, of myself, chasing a bull. And uh, my publisher actually doctored this photograph and take away my favorite bull and make it into the cover of the book. But they turned the direction around so that instead of running into the spine of the book, now I'm shown running out of the Gobi. Uh, but that gives you some idea of where we found ourselves. So we built shelters to spend the deep winter over there that look like this. So this is myself on the left-hand side, standing together with a friend in front of the shelters that we built for ourselves. In wintertime, I can tell you the temperature inside was exactly the same as the temperature outside because there was no heating. The only source of fuel that we had, I show you the bull, was car manure, dried car manure that we would spend hours scavenging the desert, collecting them. Every night before bedtime, we will build a little bonfire of dried cow manure to give us a little warmth to enable us to remove our garment in order to get into bed. Otherwise, in that kind of temperature, I think last year when it was the coldest day in Chicago, it was exceedingly difficult even to remove one piece of garment to go to bed. So the cow manure was our savior. And when I first went to America, I learned that when people disagree with each other, they say, bullshit. And I thought to myself, that thing used to be very dear to me. <laughs> In wintertime, we were ordered to march many, many miles onto a frozen lake to do this, cutting reeds, reeds, grow on the lake, and in wintertime, the water is frozen solid. So we use this cool tool with an iron blade in front of it, and I had to use all my bodily strength to push this thing forward to cut down reeds. Our job was to cut down per person half metric ton or about 1,000 pounds of reeds every day. And this is used for paper pulp. We have to ship it miles and miles into a paper mill. And that was a very, very hard job. 1,000 pounds per person per day in freezing temperature with an empty stomach. It was a very, very hard job. But before we could finish, couldn't go back to have our next meal. We were provided with two meals a day, one eight o'clock in the morning. There was never enough to eat, to eat, and it was always very bad food. And then by one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, I would be so hungry, all my energy would be spent, and my stomach would be empty. I would feel chill inside and out, shivering, but we had to continue the work in order to finish our quota. We did this day in, day out, in every winter. And this is, again, a photograph of myself. And this is my friend bundling up, tidying up the reeds in order for us to ship by an ice sledge, pulled by ourselves to a paper mill many, many miles away. And the toughest thing, in fact, was not starvation, it was the thirst. Because even though we were standing, we were working on top of a millions of gallons of water, we were on top of a lake, on the ice of a lake, but there was no water. To get onto water, you have to dig through the ice, which was too much of the effort. So every day we would cut open the surface of the lake, 
and will take pieces of ice out of the surface and suck on it in order to quench our thirst. And I can tell you when the temperature is minus 10, it's almost impossible to quench your thirst by sucking on ice. Ice simply doesn't melt. And what I did was to put a few pieces of ice in my pocket and take it out to suck on it from time to time. It will melt in that kind of temperature. And that's how we spend the day, every day, working hard on that lake. The starvation, the hard labor was one thing, but my biggest regret at the time was waste of people, their talents, and their lives. And I show you a picture of my friend Liu Xiaotong holding a violin. He is a very talented man. He is probably the most talented artist that I have ever met in my life. He could pick up a musical instrument of any kind, violin, accordion, accordion, uh, Chinese arhu, and without anybody teaching him, after a few weeks, he will be able to play it and play it beautifully. He knows how to paint, he knows calligraphy, he carves sails, and he's into photography. He has somewhat a broken camera with which he took 135 millimeter photos. And I still saved all those photos, as you see here. He developed them by himself, and he printed them by the, himself using devices that he made by himself. And he is a very, very talented man. But now he, and along with, uh, I would say 95% of my peers still live in poverty. The Cultural Revolution, of course, was over in 1976, long ago. But when this group of people came back to the cities, they were not trained for anything. After 10 years of no schooling, there was no knowledge, there was no skill. So in a new society, it was exceedingly difficult for any of them to be able to find a job. In fact, the way that Liu Xiaotong came back to the city was also quite dramatic. He knew how to carve seals, chops, and he used the plastic sole of his shoe to carve the official seal with which he certified he was too sick to stay in the Gobi Desert. So he was released. Relieved of his duty, he was sent back to Beijing. The difference in experience that I had was I never gave up studying or reading books. Books were all banned. Reading was frowned upon. I got into trouble by being caught for reading, but I did read in hiding books that I could lay my hands on. My study was totally random, not systematic at all, because there were hardly any books. I just read whatever I could lay my hands on. And uh, so after 10 years, I was able to catch up with my education, whereas most of my peers completely wasted their time for 10 years and therefore wasted their life. We were young, we were teenagers, but there were some older people. On the right-hand side, this gentleman by name of Yi Kong. Left-hand side was myself. In fact, while my secretary was helping me putting the slides together, he looked at this picture and she asked, which one is you? Now, at the time, of course, I was very young, but Mr. Yi was in late, in his late 50s. He was the foremost aviation expert in China at that time. He had a very colorful history and background. He was a pilot for both fighters and civilian planes. He was trained in the United States, in the Air Force, 
and in the Navy during the war, because at the time, at the time, China and the United States were allies with each other in the war effort. So he went back to China and served the old regime, fighting bombers and fight, uh, flying bombers and flying eventually civilian airliners. But in 1949, January of 1949, he did a daring deed together with his comrades. 1949 was the year that the communist rule, People's Republic of China, was founded in October. In January, the old regime was collapsing, was fleeing the country to Taiwan, and he and his comrades, Mr. Yi and his comrades, led the uprising in Hong Kong. They flew 12 aircraft from Hong Kong away from the old regime to the communist controlled areas in northern part of China, Beijing and Tianjin. Those aircraft laid the foundation for China's civil aviation industry today. So he was a founder of China's civil aviation industry, and he was considered to be a big hero at the time. And for that, he was paid a very high salary. But when the Cultural Revolution came, of course, the Red Guards accused him of being an American spy, because he served in the United States as a Kuomintang spy of the old regime, of a counter-revolutionary. So he was exiled to the Gobi to do hard labor together with us. And he and I became very close friends because he dared not to bring any books to the Gobi where he was exiled. But I secretly shared some of the books that I was able to find. So we became very close friends. And he was the first one to tell me about life in the United States, which was like a fairy tale at the time. Of course, life in the United States in 1940s when he was trained uh, over there. And he was the first one to tell me a world outside of China. He really opened my eyes. And eventually he retired out of the Gobi back to his hometown and I lost in touch with him. So this hard life, this ordeal, came to the end in 1976 when Mao died. And Deng Xiaoping who was also exiled into a, fa a factory, a tractor repair factory in Jiangxi province, came back to power. In 1978, he started a new reform known as economic reforms and open door policy. And he decided he and his comrades, he and, he and his comrades decided that uh, China was on the wrong path and the old system under which all economic activities were controlled by the state were producing only poverty and disaster. And they reflected on the lessons of the past and decided that China need to move in the direction of liberal market and that's how they started economic reforms in the direction of the market. And they started to allow private citizens to build their own businesses. And at the same time, he started the open door policy. So in 1979, China and the United States established diplomatic relationship and open the door to each other. And Deng Xiaoping visited the United States in 1979, hosted by Jimmy Carter. According to Jimmy Carter, I read his memoir, in one of the sessions that they were negotiating with each other about trade with each other, because both countries would like to open doors to trade to each other, Carter brought the subject of emigration because there was a law at the time which linked emigration to trade. And according to Carter, Deng Xiaoping leaned forward 
and said, how many people do you need? 10 million enough? And according to Carter, he quickly dropped the subject. But that opened the door for Chinese students to go to America to study. And in 1980, just about four years after I left the Gobi, and when I left the Gobi, of course, I was half illiterate after 10 years of no schooling. Um, I certainly didn't speak English, but four or five years later, I found myself in San Francisco. Here's a photograph of myself chatting with this young lady. Some of you may recognize that's Diane Feinstein. She was the mayor of San Francisco when I first arrived. I was novelty at the time. There were so few people from Red China, so I was looked at. I felt I, I, I felt like a panda. I mean, many people came to see me. I attended many parties, and I was lucky enough to meet with uh, Diane at uh, at that time. And eventually, I went on to become a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and I studied among other professors under. Professor Janet Yellen, who became the chair of Federal Reserve System, she was kind enough to write a foreword for the book. Among other things, she said he had arrived at Berkeley to start his PhD program. I was his academic advisor. I was stunned to discover that he had had no formal math training. All the math that he had learned, uh, he did he had learned by himself, uh, by candlelight, and that was the truth. But by then, it was too late for them to kick me out. So I basically moved my way through American educational system, and I eventually became a professor at the Wharton School. I understand that my book uh, has been setting very well. And some people told me that Amazon only puts their best best sellers in their physical stores, which I assume at this particular point is closed because what we're experiencing right now. But someone sent me a photograph of my book in one of the physical stores of Amazon that looks like this. When I look at the picture, I'm not quite sure about the company I keep, but it seems to me that somebody must have had a tougher life than I did. Brian, that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for really a, um, a compelling story. And, and, you know, I think one of the things that comes through so clearly and, and you tell so well is the great trauma of, of the Cultural Revolution. And as you point out, this is a national trauma. This is, this goes to the you know, the very heart of the experience of the entire country. And um, I, I'm wondering, when we look today, we, assert, we see China's complete transformation, well, a, a, a remarkable, a tremendous transformation with millions of people left, lifted out of poverty, with great wealth created, um, with a, a role on the global stage. And you talk about the generation of people, your colleagues, your peers, uh, so many of whom have not come along with you know, the, this, this transformation. How do you account for the, trans, the successful transformation out of such you know, a devastating um, experience. We hear a lot about the China model. Is there something unique here or how did, we, how did China um, achieve this? Yes, that's a very good question. Of course, in the past 40 years, China has achieved a great deal in economic development. Uh, 40 years ago, China was in dire poverty. Per capita income was about $120. And today, it's still low, but it's $10,000. When I first came to Hong Kong 27 years ago, China's GDP was exactly the same as India's GDP. Mm -hmm. you know, two countries have similar number of people in terms of population. Today, 
China's GDP is five times that of India, and per capita income is also five times that of India. So people talk about this China model as if it's something very unique. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think so. I think the story is very simple. When I was in the Gobi, when we were in the Gobi, all the economic activities were controlled by the state. And the economic system was known as central planning, very similar to that of the Soviet Union. Whether you look at China or the Soviet Union, that system didn't produce any prosperity, any wealth. It produced only poverty, starvation. We couldn't even feed ourselves. What changed was after 1979, people were allowed to move in the direction of free market to trade things, to set up their own businesses, to such an extent that today, the private sector accounts for 60% of China's GDP. 90% of urban, popula uh, urban employment, the private sector accounts for 90% of urban em uh, employment. So the state-owned sector has become relatively small. So if you talk about China economic miracle, if the miracle of free market is the miracle of a market economy, is miracle of animal spirit unleashed, as Adam Smith would call it. Mm -hmm. So I've got a question from one of our, our viewers who asks, how does the cultural revolution experience of Xi Jinping um, how does it influence his style of governance and his policy agenda today? Do you see a, do you see a relationship between uh, the Cultural Revolution experience and how she is ruling today? He spent many years in the countryside as well. I think altogether seven years. His experience I think in some ways was similar to the rest of us, in some other ways, maybe different, because that place where he went was where his father fought as a Red Army leader, and therefore the local people respected his father, even though he was in trouble, and therefore took very good care of him. Hmm. I think the lessons of the Cultural Revolution are very deep in the minds of the vast majority of the people in my generation, but not necessarily in the same way across the board. I think some people probably are more concerned about social stability because, of course, the Cultural Revolution was anarchy, total chaos, and other people were, are more concerned about a reversal of the policies of Mao, the style that Mao ruled the country. So it's all different. And people take different lessons from the his, his same historical experience. Yeah, well, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I am so grateful for you sharing your story. And there's so much more we could discuss. Uh, and I would really enjoy an opportunity to discuss. Unfortunately, we're out of time for now. But I want to encourage people who want to uh, get more of your story and more of uh, that you shared with us uh, to uh, check out your book, Out of the Gobi, My Story of China and America. I also want to let our listeners and viewers know that this will be posted on social media um, tomorrow. And I encourage you to share it uh, with anyone you think would be interested in the program. Uh, Shen, thank you so much for doing this. I'm sorry that you weren't able to come to Chicago, although I don't, uh, I, I'm glad you didn't have to relive the, the weather of the Gobi Desert um, if you were to have come. 
Um, but I really appreciate you you doing this. Thank you uh, very much, and um, good luck. Please uh, stay healthy and safe. Great pleasure. Same to you and to all, all of right. you. Thank you very much.